to the Gospel of John, chapter 15. John 15, verse 8 and verse 16. That's John chapter 15. That's the one about the Jesus talking about, I am the vine, you are the branches. And he's talking about bearing fruit. And we're going to look at two verses, verse 8, verse 16. John 15, 8, John 15, 16. When you've got it and you look up, I'll know that you're ready. John 15, 8, and verse 16 also. There he is looking up. Thank you. We're glad to have you back from Hawaii. We prayed for you, Jesse, while you were in Hawaii. We're glad to see that you made it through. All right, John 15, verse 8. Jesus said, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you, and I've ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. So what's God ordained us for? To go and bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it you. So that ability to pray and ask whatever God puts in our heart to pray and intercede for, uh, to ask and have those answers, the qualification is to be a fruit-bearing person, to be somebody who is bringing forth fruit and your fruit remains. It's almost like, it's almost like, and I know this probably just flies in the face of popular culture today, but it's almost like God is interested in results. You know, he says, I want you to go bear fruit and I want you to, be, to uh, bring forth fruit that will remain so that whatever you ask for, the Father will give it to you. Who's God giving things to? People who want to bear fruit. And so the Lord is helping fruitful and fruit-bearing people. So I want to share a couple things about fruit this morning. And we've come to the final and the fourth F and the four Fs, fellowship, focus, function, and fruit. And the first thing I want to say is, how does God measure our lives? Think of that question. When your life is over with, how will your life be measured by God? The scripture talks about fruit being the thing that God uses to measure your life. Fruit, your fruit specifically, is what your life produced, not what your life was like. Many people strive to have a prosperous life or they, they work at having a self-fulfilling life or some people work to have an easy life. For most people, they're interested in how their life goes. But there's going to come a day, and hopefully it comes before the last day of our life, where we realize that our life is really amounts to what we've produced and not how things went in our life. So, God will actually measure your life by the fruit that your living produced. When God adds up your life, the scale won't measure how you felt about yourself. The scale's not going to measure how you compared to other people. Or is it going to measure how other people felt about you or what they thought about you? But when God measures your life, what your living produced, did those results matter to God? That is what's going to sit in the scale when you and I face God in eternity. Did my living produce results that mattered to God? That is a sobering and, and that can sound like a harsh question. I think before the message is over today, you're going to be encouraged so... Um, there's a lot more joy in that question, that thought, than you might think. But that question is the question that will measure your life. Did my living produce results that matter to God? And the answer to that question is what we call fruit. That's what the Bible is calling fruit. What did your life add up to? 
So fruit is not what people give you credit for, but fruit is what God gives you credit for. In Colossians 1 and verse 10, it says that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. So if the results of your life is what God considers fruit, and that's what your, the content of your life amounts to, we probably should find out what God considers to be fruit. So that's the next thing I'd like to talk about. I'd like you to think for a few minutes with me. What does God consider fruit in our life? Well, if we're going to think about the fruit in the kingdom of God, in God's kingdom, we can't do that without thinking about the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God. Because the Bible says that everything in the kingdom of God grows out of the seed of the word. In fact, in the parable of the sower, which was Jesus' essential teaching about the kingdom of God and growing the fruit of the kingdom. So that parable of the sower is all about fruit growing. Um, there was a little section I'd like to read to you in Mark chapter 4, verse 26. <clears throat> and moving on. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed or scatter the word. He's already established in this parable that the seed is the word of God. So the kingdom of God is as if a person should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises day and night, and the seed sprouts and grows, but he doesn't know how, because the earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the gray grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And Jesus went on to say, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown, it is the smallest of all seeds in the earth, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants, puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can come and make their nests in its shade. And with many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. Interestingly, he said, how do we compare the kingdom of God? You plant a seed, it grows. And he says, in the case of the mustard seed, the smallest seed, it produces a pretty large plant with branches that spread out. But notice that the fruit, the significance and the importance of the fruit isn't how big it is, but the function that it provides. It says it provides shade and birds can come and build their homes in it. In other words, it provides a service that God has, has ordained. So if I could summarize that, when God measures fruit in our life, he doesn't measure it in, in things like quantity or volume or dimension or size, but he measures it, is it doing what I wanted your life to provide? The birds could uh, land and people could have shade in the mustard tree. In our life, God has a purpose for each and every one of us and then for us collectively. So fruit is us doing what God wants us to do in our life, that which is his will. So the word produces the fruit. That's why we fellowship with God to get the word. That's why focus is important. It's understanding of the word. Function is us doing the word. And the result is the word grows in our life into activities that manifest the kingdom of God. So the word of God is where fruit originates. In John chapter 15 and verse 5, where Jesus said, I am the vine and, and uh, I've ordained you. I just want to read that one section. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I and my words live in them, he it is that bears much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. So the extent that you allow God's word to manifest and grow is basically your contribution to fruit. God wants you to be credited with bringing forth fruit. He said, you are identified as my disciples by the fruit that you bring forth. So 
you bringing forth fruit is really a matter of how much you allow his kingdom to be manifest in you. And the fruit of the kingdom of God, Paul spoke about it in Romans chapter 14 when he said, the kingdom of God is not food or drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So think about it. The kingdom of God is righteousness. That refers to your position in God, your right standing in God. And it's peace. That, that has to do with your day in and day out life. Are you living in peace? Because if you are in continual fellowship with God and walking in that focus, you'll have peace in your life. You could be a Christian and go to church and not have peace. All of us have days where we, where we don't walk in peace because we're not walking in that communion with God. So the kingdom of God is not manifesting its peace in us in that day. So it's, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Joy is you expressing the praise of God. That is joy. It's, it's the, it is the expression of appreciation and thanksgiving and joy. And that's why what Pat said was so important, that we should continually praise the Lord, that praise should continually flow from our lips because when it does, joy will circulate and the kingdom of God is manifest in our life. So righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, having those things manifest day to day in your life makes you a fruitful person. Church cannot produce that in your life. We come together to be exhorted, to remind each other, to experience the presence of God. But each of us must work out our own salvation and in fellowship with the Lord Jesus. The church, you by yourself or other people, no institution can produce fruit in you. You can't even produce fruit by yourself. Why? Because it grows as a result of the Word working in your life. So as the Word's working in you, the Word itself, remember Jesus said in the parable, the sower sows the seed, it grows up day and night. He's watching it, waiting for it to happen. He's not doing anything but waiting, and suddenly it starts to appear. He says he doesn't know how because it grows by itself. I'd like to take the last few minutes of this message and just bring a little practical insight as to what the types of fruit might look like in our life. If, if the word produces or enables us to produce fruit or produces fruit in us or through us, what are some of those things and what do they look like? Well, let me begin by saying I need to clear up something that is a, um, an obstacle, I think, when it comes to Christians bearing fruit. And that is the tendency to think that the only activities that God considers fruit are those that result in leading sinners to Jesus. In other words, when I stand before God, he's going to want to know, how many people did I lead to Jesus? Well, I, I led three uh, that I really know of that really got saved. Or I led 3,000. So the tendency is to think, well, that guy that went out and led personally is responsible for leading 3,000 people to Christ. His life is going to be much more significant. He's bringing much more fruit in, into eternity than the person who just brought three. We think quantity. We think in numbers. We think in volume. There is an inherent danger in thinking that the only fruit God cares about is who you have led to Jesus or how many people you've gotten saved. Now, Surely that is bearing fruit, to lead someone to Christ. That's fruit, that's, but that's not all the fruit in the kingdom of God. That's just a manif one manifestation of fruit. In fact, when Jesus taught about each of us being a tree and the tree is known by its fruit, he said, each tree is known by its own fruit. Men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from briar bushes. So different plants produce different products. A fig tree doesn't make grapes. A grape vine makes grapes. A fig tree makes figs. So you might be a fig tree. And if you're producing figs in your life, you are fruitful. So you get the general idea that Jesus sees that there's many kinds of fruit and you don't want to get into that trap where you're looking at somebody thinking, 
Well, that person, boy, they, they are just, they're an evangelist, you know, and they just get all these people saved. That's fruitful. I'll never be like that. I'm doomed to going to heaven without any fruit because I just can't go out and witness to people. I, I just, I'm not any good at it. So let's talk now about some of the things that are uh, considered by God to be fruit in your life. Well, the first one is kind of obvious. It, it's when you're involved in the process of sowing the word into people who themselves become fruitful. In that parable of the sower, uh, Jesus said um, that uh, he that received the seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and brings forth some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And so if you help people to come into the kingdom and they become fruitful, that's fruit that accounts to your credit. If you're a Sunday school teacher or you sit with your own children or you mentor others, you spend time just sowing the word into people, they're acting upon what you have sown Amen. that produces fruit is fruit that is to your account as well. Praise the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? That is really great. Um, another thing that God considers being fruitful is when you're involved in nurturing and encouraging the faith of other people. You know, we have disappointments all the time. Uh, we have discouragements. We are in situations in life that where there's tension or where there's depression. Or maybe we, we find ourselves in a situation, perhaps in our family or at work or among our friends, where there's been some kind of a terrible failure and, and there's people around you that are that are cast down and brokenhearted, nurturing and lifting up specifically the faith of other people, God considers that to be eternal fruit. When you lift up the faith of other people. So when you find yourself in situations, um, you know, and you want to be empathetic and you want to help out, ask the Lord to show you, how can I specifically encourage the faith in that person? Um, a scripture that I think expresses it is uh, Paul writes in the first chapter of Romans and he says, um, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, how often I wanted to come and visit you in order that I might obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. So he, he's writing to the Romans, he said, I want to come and see you so that that I can help produce some fruit among you. He wants to nurture them in the faith and encourage them. And so God sees that as fruit. Another way that, that God looks upon our life and says, now that woman is fruitful, is when we display the character of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When we display the character of the Holy Spirit, God says that's fruit. So if you're the kind of person who walks in the fruit of the Spirit, every time you walk in the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, you think the person out there that's bringing forth quant large quantities of identifiable fruit, wow, 100 people got saved and, and that person had a, had a meeting, a street meeting, and 100 people got saved, that's fabulous, we praise God. Why do we praise God for that? Because God did it. Um, you know, God, nobody saves anybody. God saves people. We, do you know that? But if you're the person, I can't go out on the street and hold a meeting and talk. To, I would, I'd be tongue-tied. I wouldn't know what to say. And you feel like, well, I guess I'm not going to have any fruit. But if you're the kind of person, who, when you manifest long-suffering, you're in a situation where instead of saying, I quit, I'm angry, I throw in the towel, I give up. Instead, you, you pace, sit back patiently, Cast your cares upon the Lord, and you, and you let the Holy Spirit, you deliberately say, I, I need to retreat to the character of the Holy Spirit. I need to fellowship with God and retreat into the character. The Holy Spirit rises up and gives you the ability to endure and long-suffering and stay gracious in the midst of that trial. You have produced fruit. You have produced tremendous fruit. The Bible says it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work 
which his presence within you accomplishes love, joy, peace, long-suffering. So God counts that as fruit. You are a fruitful Christian when you walk in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And you think, well, now how does that contribute to the kingdom of God? Because the Bible says you should be the light of the world. When you go around and you're walking in peace, you're inspiring peace in other people. When you walk in joy, you're inspiring joy in others. You are shining. The Bible says, let your light shine before men. You might not be the person who specifically talks to that unsafe person, but that person who is destined to become one of God's great apostles of faith, but now they're just a rank sinner, their first introduction to Jesus was seeing you when you should have been flipping out, having a nervous breakdown, walking in peace and giving God praise. They didn't talk to you, you didn't talk to them, but they saw that and it opened their heart up. They said, wow, I didn't even know that was possible in this life. That person has something I want. And they may not say that out there in the front of their mind, but it percolates in their thinking. And uh, it starts to, des- to open up that person's heart. So a desire opens up. And then maybe a few days or a week or a month, sometime later, here comes somebody, drops a word of the gospel in that person's heart, and it falls on good ground. Why did it fall on good ground? Because your displaying the fruit of the Spirit opened up their hard ground so that it became good ground. So you, you, you need to understand that... It's not just the, the, the guy who's got the wheel of the ship steering it who is the one-man navy. It's all hands on deck. It's everybody that's, everyone that has a job on that ship is helping that ship to move forward. Praise the Lord. Okay, so let's take a look at another one. What is another thing that God considers to be fruit? Here's one that, I guarantee, will encourage maybe some of you more than others. And that is embracing God's correction and discipline so that it refines and improves you. Now, Hebrews says, we all hate, Hebrews 12 says, we all hate to be reproved by God. We hate discipline, we hate reproof, but afterwards it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It produces great fruit in the kingdom of God when you let the Lord turn you around. When you are stuck in an attitude or in a behavior that is not productive in the kingdom of God, the Father's good. He'll come. He'll correct you. He'll rebuke. He'll reprove you in whatever tone he needs to take with you. You know, have you ever noticed God's tone? He needs to take with people's different with different people. God takes a more hard tone with people that need a hard tone. He, he takes an easy, soft tone with people that you just have to look at them and they melt. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. One of my granddaughters was like that. And, and when she was little, I just thought, oh my, you know, we need to be really careful when we correct her because... If we just look at her and she sees a, a little bit of disapproval in her eyes, she just goes, falls apart and starts crying, you know. So, or there's kids like me. You have to beat them. And then there's no guarantee they're going to get it. So, but when you let God discipline you, When you let him turn you around, you let him bring refining into your life so that it improves you as a witness for the Lord. That is great glory. You should be proud. You should be proud of yourself and your relationship with the Lord when you let that happen in your life. And I hope I'm talking to mature Christians today, so when I say you should be proud, you understand. I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm not talking about being egotistical. But, you know, we walk around and we, we beat ourselves up so much we don't understand. God wants us to be proud of the good things in our life. Not self-confident pride, but proud of the, the work that God is doing in us. Glad would be a nice way of saying it. My pride is rooted in my gladness that he saved me. I'm glad that, that he's, I know where my strength comes from. Here's another one. 
Uh, and it's uh, amazing. I think the Lord kind of set this up this morning. Thanking and praising Jesus. Thanking and praising Jesus is a fruit. It's a powerful fruit when you, and, and sometimes it's a bigger fruit than another fruit when you're doing it at a time when you don't want to praise. The, when you're, then it's an offering of praise that you're lifting, lifting up. You know, sometimes in church people will come in and everything, and you almost got to hook them and just, just pull on them to pull a, pull a praise out of them. Just put, could you possibly just lift your voice a little bit? You got to pull, you know, you, you think God's got to pay them to praise it. Um, but then there's times when you're in that situation, and uh, you've just gotten some bad news. Um, you woke up tired and in pain. Uh, you just got laid off from your job. Um, somebody crossed you, you've lost something valuable or important, you can't find it, maybe three bad things this week have happened in a row. You know what I'm talking about. You're in that place where the last thing that naturally is bubbling up in you is praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And, and so you've had the week where all the bad stuff's going on and you just say, you know what, I'm going to turn aside and I'm just going to... I'm just going to have church, me and me and the Lord, and I'm just going to praise my God. And you know what happens. It doesn't take but a few moments, and there's a turnover t happens within you, and it's like, oh, my God, why didn't I do this earlier? Well, Hebrews chapter 13 says, Through him, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips that give thanks to his name. So when we praise the Lord in sincerity and our mind and heart is connected and we mean it and we're praising God, God says, that's fruit. That, you know what that means? It goes instantly to heaven where it's preserved for eternity. Fruit in the kingdom of God does not dissolve. The Bible says God is faithful to weigh out and to keep everything that is committed. Paul said, I am persuaded that he will keep everything I've committed to him. You know, when you lay your life down, when you make a sacrifice, when you want to, when you want to do something your flesh wants you to do, but you turn away and do something God wants you to do, you know, maybe you've gotten past that trial and it's over with. And a month later, you're in a similar situation and you don't feel good about yourself. Feel good about this, that a month before, when you said yes to the Holy Spirit, when you turned to God, that was immediately swept up into the kingdom of God and it is there in heaven. It is there. It is on your account. It is fruit kept. God does not forget the fruit that we bear in our life. I guarantee you, He keeps it and He intends to reward it. He intends to reward it. So somebody give the Lord some praise this morning. Hallelujah. Man, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> here's, <clears throat> here's another one, and this will be the last one that I show. There's so many, but I thought this was important enough to bring it, bring it out. When you do the work of a peacemaker, diffusing strife and bringing factions together like a bridge builder in righteousness, two parties or three parties are at odds and there's a brokenness and disagreement, particularly among God's people. But anywhere where you find that, <clears throat> that strife and, and uh, you find the lack of peace, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Being a peacemaker is great fruit in the kingdom of God. Bridging the differences between two parties so that whereas they were divided, and in, in faction against one another, now there's peace and they're communicating. Things may not be perfect, but, but peace has bridged the potential strife that was about to break out. If you can be a peacemaker, if you can find yourself, now here, let's, let's, make, this, let's make this specific. If, if you can find yourself in a social setting and all of a sudden things start getting a little weird, People start talking about things. It's just something's not right. The conversation goes from 
talking about whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is good, of a good report, whatever is lovely. And now they're starting, there's a little tension and, and anger starting to come in. People are talking about, they're angry about what they saw on TV or they're, maybe they start introducing a little seed of gossip here and there. Did you hear about so-and-so? And next thing you know, people are expressing opinions that they should never express. They're now, they're now joining in and making comments. Yeah, you know, I noticed that, da, da, da. and that topic should never have even brought up, been brought up publicly. You know why? The Bible says love, listen to me, love covers a multitude of sins. When you walk in love, you're not out talking about your brothers and sisters. And even if it's not a horrible thing, you're, you know that you're introducing them into a conversation in an inhospitable light. You're sharing things about them that are just not praiseworthy. The Bible says if there's any praise, if there's any virtue, if there's any goodness, think on these things. Talk about these things. And so you're there in a group setting. And all of a sudden, someone starts to introduce that those elements in the conversation that begin to bring potential for strife or begin to bring potential for division and uh, tension. And you can immediately, when that happens, immediately you can feel the Holy Spirit just leaves, leaves the meeting, just begins to leave the room. He just starts backing off. Um, and you recognize what's happening and you sit there and you say, Lord, I want to be a peacemaker. Show me how I can bring a bridge of peace back into this conversation. Lord might say, get up and leave. It can't be done. <laughs> so if he says that, fine. <laughs> you just do it. But, but I think too often we either do that or we just sit there and do nothing. But how about the peacemakers? What are they? The Bible spoke about peacemakers. Jesus talked about peacemakers. It is a, it, it is a fruit in the kingdom of God. And so maybe some of the things that are being talked about are things you have personal feelings about and you'd like to jump into the conversation. You feel like you've got a contribution to make. You feel like, you know, I'd, I'd like to chime in on this. I've got a few points that I'd like to make. But you begin by saying, I am not going to utter anything. I'm not going to contribute to this conversation. And you open up your mouth because God gives you a little phrase or something to say. And it, it immediately takes the attention off of where it was at and puts it back on the Lord. And people begin to say, yeah, and they start talking about Jesus again. That's a peacemaker. See, you could be a peacemaker without trying to uh, um, super impress two parties and say, okay, I'm going to be a peacemaker amongst you and I'm going to solve this problem. I want you to listen to me, look at me. You don't have to do any of that. You could be humble. Isn't that awesome? Just in humility, just lift up Jesus. He'll draw people back to him. And that is fruit. You should be proud of yourself if you're a peacemaker. Hallelujah. Because that's fruit in the kingdom of God. Let me close this and share with you a thought. Well, let me just summarize that. That list could go on and on. Really, the fact is that in all of the many ways that you reflect God's glory, He considered those to be fruit in the kingdom of God. So it's not just winning the lost, praise the Lord. It's anything that glorifies and lifts Him up. This morning, we want to respond what we would call an, an altar call to respond today. And I was thinking of Jesus on the cross. Appropriately, it's Communion Sunday. And how that Jesus turned over to the thief on one side and said, Today, you will be with me in paradise. And uh, I, I was reading that in my morning devotional today. And all of a sudden, it hit me. I mean, I've been reading this for decades. And it just hit me. What would I feel like if my life suddenly was intersected with the Messiah, Jesus, and I found myself dying as a wasted life on a cross? What if I woke up that morning in jail and with a, a loud knock on the door and guards broke in and rudely grabbed me and drugged me off to the Calvary's Hill? 
and nailed me and another prisoner up. I had no idea I was going to be executed today. Today's it. Time's run out, and there I am. But between the two of us, I've heard about this guy, this Messiah, and there he is, the Lamb of God. And the one guy starts railing on him, well, if you're really the Son of God, and he's bitter. But you say, this man's done nothing. We deserve this. This man's done nothing. And you say to him, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, can you possibly remember me? And Jesus turns to you and says, I mean, he's in the worst and yet the greatest moment of his earthly life. And you are the only person who sh share that foxhole with Jesus at that very moment. He turns to you and says, today, you and I are going to be together. He wasn't making a theological statement. He was speaking assurance and love to that man at that moment. Your life has been a complete and total waste up till now. You're dying as a criminal. The, the earth is being rid of you, but I am redeeming you, and I am taking you to glory, and you will be with me today in paradise I thought, oh my God, that is wonderful. Well, this is what I want to say to you today. One day will be your last day. And on that day, Jesus will meet you. And he will bring you, just like he did that thief. He will bring you into eternal life with him. It's going to happen to each and every one of you. But unlike the thief, who did not have the opportunity to get off the cross and go live a few more years and build up some fruit. He went into eternity with not a bit of fruit whatsoever, except one thing. He accepted Jesus at the last moments of his life. And Jesus said, you have paradise with me forever. Well, if receiving Jesus will get you paradise with God forever, imagine what going into eternity with a life full of fruit will produce. Because the Bible says the Lord will weigh out your life and he will reward you. It says no man can lay another foundation other than what has been laid, Jesus Christ. If the work that you build on that foundation survives, it is eternal, it's considered fruit, you shall receive a reward. Man, just being with God for eternity is a wonderful reward. I don't know what God's got up his sleeve for people that, that deliberately bear fruit in this life. But the Bible says this, I has not seen nor ear heard. It has not even entered the heart of man the things that God has stored up for you. He's got jars, I guess, or some sort of containers that have got all your fruit in them. All the things that you don't think God considered good fruit. You may not think of yourself as a fruitful person, but you probably are a lot more fruitful than you give yourself credit for. Hallelujah. You know, I think to know that in the simplest of ways that we allow God to manifest himself through our life, that that is eternal fruit should encourage each and every one of us to do it more. Amen. Amen. Stand with me.